Hello, I'm Rob Pomatier, one of the co-authors of the textbook Marketing Strategy Based on First Principles in Data Analytics. In this session, we're going to go through Chapter 3. Chapter 3 is focused on the market principle that all customers change, thus you need to manage customer dynamics. The agenda for today is first we're going to go through an introduction. I'm just going to go through and kind of set up what I mean by all customers change and what firms are doing to deal with it. And then we're going to go through, in a, in a very detailed fashion, the approaches for managing customer dynamics. First, we'll go through the evolution. How have, how has marketers treated this issue over time? And then we're going to go through some more advanced techniques, including one analytical technique of choice models, which is a very powerful um, empirical modeling way to, to study acquisition, expansion, and retention. And then finally, we're going to end with the framework of customer dynamics, looking at from the inputs, the outputs, and the process. But first, just looking at it overall. All customers change is one of the, is the second of the first principles. The first one we dealt with was all customers differ. Now we're going to say not only do they differ due to inherent needs, but they change over time. Customers' desires and needs change over time, and they change for many different reasons. Consumers could change because just as they age and their experience changes, as they get new, um, maybe a new job, have children, they could be trigger events that cause you to change. They also change because whatever the industry you're operating in, maybe the industry is brand new. When the industry is very brand new, customers perceive a lot of risk. And so how they evaluate it, they want to go to storage, they want to talk to salespeople. But as the industry evolves and everybody becomes very knowledgeable about the product category, then they're much more able to buy the product online and they don't perceive as much risk in the product. So these are kind of product, or in some cases, even industry changes. So overall, what we have to recognize, customers' needs vary not only do inherent differences in people, which we really spoke about in the first market principle of all customers differ, but they also change as both people and markets change over time. Thus, we need to adapt our status segmentation, our STP analysis that we talked about overall, that we did for the whole market, we need to adapt that to focus on just our existing customers to understand how their needs change over time. To define customer dynamics, and that's going to be managing customer dynamics, is how we deal with this idea that all customers change. We define that as are all changes in customer preferences that occur over time. And there can be many sources of them. We're going to look at five different sources of why customers change over time. Let's look at the first one, discrete life events. I think that's probably the easiest to understand. You get married, life changes. You have children. Let's say you have um, triplets. You have three kids and one day your life fundamentally changes. It probably changes your car. It changes your financial situation. It might change even the type of house you need. So specific discrete life events. Then there's ones that are more general that just happen as you age. As an individual goes through their life and they age, and they get older, they might start perceiving that their life will end at some point and they become interested in products like retirement, uh, maybe even funeral services and all, and, and estate planning. There's product learning effects. So no matter what discrete events are happening in your life or what age you are, when you first start with a product, you have to learn about that product. If you don't understand how the product works, you're going to maybe not want, let's say if we look at this, let's say you're just getting into riding um, bicycles long distance. You're really, really getting into biking. So as you look at that, in the beginning you don't know much about it. You go to a shop, you maybe buy a, a lower end bike. They seem pretty expensive. You don't really wear all the get up. But as you get more knowledgeable about it, there might be other characteristics of that bike that you weren't very interested in the first time you bought a bike and you want to upgrade the bike. And now you want all these sophisticated characteristics. That happened because you learned about them over time. It's very well known that as you learn more about wine, you start buying more and more expensive wines. Same idea. Those would be product learning effects. So that's really the third source of customer dynamics. The fourth is the product market life cycle. This is the idea that as the industry matures, people's perceived risk and how they want to shop for it changes. Not at the individual level, but at the whole industry level. For example, when PCs were first launched, people might have only wanted to buy it at a retail store. They didn't really understand it, they needed some training. 
But as the industry matured and, and almost everybody, um, the types of products and the type of computing products have standardized to a certain extent, people are much more comfortable to buy it online. There's many different vendors. So that happens at the product market level. And then the last one is just the overall environmental context. Sometimes this is grouped under the industry life cycle. That would be something like norms in society about the environment. If everybody's becoming more sensitive about saving energy or protecting the environment, that could change how you think about products in the other categories. So overall, what's interesting about this, the, the bottom four are all happening almost on an ongoing basis. And then there's these individual discrete events. These all sum together for each of your customers and they vary how they're, what desires they have for the product. So one of the things that makes marketing pretty tough is think back to when we talked about the last session, all customers different. You broke customers into different groups. It took us quite a bit of work to understand here was a homogeneous group of customers that I'm gonna focus on. So you think you've really solved what the customer needs and wants. Soon as you do that, six months later, some of those customers are starting to diverge. Some have discrete life events. The whole group of them are striding to age and mature in the product. And um, that's changing their product needs and desires. So one of the things a firm has to do is try to make sure they're constantly bringing in new customers that are at the beginning of the life cycle because some of these older customers or maybe not just in age but from a maturity on the product could be moving on. So overall there's five sources of customer dynamics. So thus customer dynamics we argue is a fundamental problem that all firms must address when having an effective marketing strategy. Since all customers change if you fail to address customers changing you'll ultimately lead to poor business performance and Buick is a prime example. They lost about 50% of their sales over time because Buick failed to bring in new, younger customers. At one time, their average customer age of a person buying a Buick was over 60 years old. What's the problem with that? If you're a 25-year-old consumer and you want to go buy a car, do you think it impacts you if everybody else you've seen driving a Buick is 60? And remember, that was the average age they're buying. So there were some people in their 70s or 75s buying a Buick. So ultimately, the brand got associated with older people. What's the problem with that? Younger people stop buying. If younger people stop buying, then your whole product portfolio starts aging. If that ends up happening, you're ultimately going to be in trouble because your, your customers will die and you'll have no customers left. So you have to manage customer dynamics. So market principle two is that all customers change and effective marketing strategy must manage customer dynamics. Let me give you a little more information between Buick and Honda. Here's two firms that manage their customer dynamics differently. Buick failed to manage customer dynamics. Customers' needs changed, customers moved to different suppliers. But Buick just kept letting their customer had a smaller portfolio and they were aging customers. They did not refresh the brand or the product offering to what people wanted earlier in the life cycle. What did it result in? It resulted in 50% sales drops. Honda saw the same thing. What Honda saw was their customers were aging, becoming more successful, getting promoted, and they were moving on to BMW, Mercedes, Lexus, whatever. So they said, we need another brand. We need another brand so that when they left the Honda and they wanted to go to a higher price point, they could go to something and they launched Acura. Honda realized it was migrating to more expensive. They launched Acura with a high-priced luxury car. Within a few years, Acura is one of the best-selling luxury brands in the US. Different managing customer dynamics. Managing customer dynamics is very important. Again, if you're using MarkStrat, I have one slide to show how does MarkStrat allow you to understand customer dynamics. What they do is they have a number of different segments in MarkStrat, and these segments are changing over time. Some are growing inside, some are becoming more sensitive to price, others have more competitors, and others have changing needs. So, if you're in that simulation, you have to constantly be revising your positioning of your product to match your target segment. If you don't, your product will be left, and there'll only be the customers with a strong brand attachment that stay with you, usually at a much smaller. They also have another product line, which is a brand new emerging market. And we see in brand new emerging markets, people usually start buying in innovators and early adopters, and ultimately 
the mainstream market begins. We'll talk more about this concept on under offerings and launching of new innovative products. But Markstrat does deal with customer dynamics, the second principle. So next one I want to go through is I want to go through the approaches we have for managing customer dynamics. So we know we have this problem, customers are changing. So as marketers, how are we going to deal with it? The first thing I'm going to do is go through the evolution of those approaches, big picture, and then I'm going to go in a little more detail of each one and then talk about choice models. So first, the evolution. The very first way, and this still shows up in many marketing textbooks, was the life cycle approach. What the life cycle approach did, it took all five sources of change and really dropped them into one curve and say customers go through a life cycle. What is the advantage of it? And they do sometimes break that out at, at customer level, product level, and industry level. But it averages all the customers in your database to say they all follow the same path. Well, guess what? That doesn't happen. Customers are different and they change. Does everybody, if you're selling a, a car to someone and you have a pool of, let's say, I don't know, 100,000 customers and the average person buying your car is 25, do you think they all have children at the same age? No. Some will have children within a few months and that might change their needs of cars. Somebody might wait 15 or 20 years. So you can't just average everybody together. But that's the advantage of it. It's very simple and it's easy to understand. The disadvantage is assumes all customers follow one curve. We know that's not the case. It averages all customers, which is also a problem. And it ignores the causes. And these causes are important because they allow you to understand before they happen. So that was the first way we dealt with it. The second way is what we're going to do now. This is called dynamic customer segmentation. The idea is we know customers evolve. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing we did for the overall market where we segmented customers, but now we're going to focus just on our own customer portfolio and we're going to look at customers that first come in. When do the, the very first time you buy into my car, I'm going to group those people together. I'm going to call them an acquisition stage. They're new customers and we're going to treat them as a homo homogeneous group and we're going to segment them. Then we're going to look at the expansion stage and we're going to look at retention stage. So what it's doing, it's breaking your customer portfolio into three groups, early, middle, and late, if you will. And then it's segmenting within there in order to understand why do they get triggered? Why do people move from, let's say, the acquisition stage to expansion? And we'll go to understand it. The good van, it combines life cycle and segmentation. So it takes a little bit of our learning from market principle one. It matches marketing with um, matches strategic marketing thinking. What do I mean by that? Typically, firms really have an effort focused on customer acquisition and customer retention. So we also do segments around that within our own customer portfolio. And that's an advantage because that's how the firm's already naturally thinking about it. It identifies temporally homogeneous groups. And what do I mean by temporally homogeneous groups? It means that across the life cycle or across your own customer portfolio, Customers that all join you in, in the first um, month or so, or in some products, it might be six months or a year, are very similar to each other. Let's picture online banking. The first month, let's say everybody on this side of the room starts an online banking account tomorrow. You guys are all relatively similar. You're all learning the system. You're probably going to run into some problems. And in that case, I want to treat you as a homogeneous group. One bank found out they could do something. If they called a customer within their first two months of an online bank as a health checkup, that's what they call it. They just called and say, hey, how's the online banking account? Do you have any problems? If the person says, yeah, I have a little issue, they resolve it right on the phone there. By doing that, they can improve retention of that customer at the online bank by double 12 months later. However, if this group is, let's say, the middle customers, you've been at the online bank for a year, maybe two years, we'll call it the expansion group. If I call you in, let's say, the first eight months, the first year, it has no statistical impact on your retention in the future. Only if I call you in the beginning. Why? Because in the beginning, you haven't completely formed your opinion. We call that the onboarding stage. But that's why we want to treat early acquired customers in a homogeneous group. We, want, we know that they're a little bit different. Then we could look down here to the retention group. In the retention group, these are people that might have been at the online bank for seven or eight years. 
they might be starting to shop and look at other banks, see if there's anybody else out there better. I might need to put a loyalty program. I might need to give them some more services so they stay with me. So I'm gonna really focus on retention. Usually the middle group, we focus on expansion. So in this online banking, maybe I'll do online loans and I'll start targeting you after one or two years with some advertisement on online loans. So you can see I'm gonna treat the acquisition group, the expansion group, which is just middle group, and people that we think are at risk of being lost as a retention group. And within that group, we're gonna break people into um, different segments also. So that's the dynamic segmentation. The last group is really not so much of a whole new way to deal with customer dynamics as a way to combine into the dynamic segmentation. But it also it helps tremendously. And it's called customer lifetime value. The idea of customer lifetime value is I'm going to look at any brand new customer I acquire and I'm going to say I know you and based on knowing you, I'm going to predict how long you're going to stay at my firm. I'm going to predict how much you're going to buy. By doing that, I'm gonna discount all those sales and profits back now, and I'm gonna give you one number that represents your discounted cash flow or your net present value of how much you're worth to me as a firm. I'll do that with all the customers there. I might find one of these acquisition customers is worth 10 times more than another because I've learned over time, this kind of customer turns into a very good customer over time. The other one typically leaves after three months. By doing that, I can make much better decisions. Why? Do I maybe want to treat somebody who's a high customer lifetime value a little different? Absolutely. Some banks have 20 to 30 million incoming phone calls a year for a big bank. So how do they deal with that? Well, they're using both caller ID and sometimes you enter your account number and they identify your customer lifetime value. If you're a high customer lifetime value, they give you to a call center person who's very well trained and you don't wait on the phone as long. If you're a very low customer lifetime value, they give you with the, the newer people who maybe aren't as well trained and you might have to wait in the queue longer. So they treat the customers different. Now you might say, well, that's not fair. Well, from the firm's standpoint, it is fair. It is fair because don't you want to treat your best customers who's providing the most profits and sales to you, don't you want to treat them better maybe than customers you don't? It makes economic sense. So customer lifetime value is a way to capture that. Okay, so let's go through each one. First, I'm gonna talk about the life cycle. The customer life cycle, as I mentioned earlier, is not, not an optimal system. It averages all the customers together and treats them the same at each stage. It ignores trigger points, pretty much, and is very often inaccurate. Here's an example of what you would see in a typical textbook in marketing. More in the past, but they're still in there, where we say all customers move through this life cycle. In the introduction stage, they're brand new. It's when the products just launch. In this case, we're looking at a, at a, a product life cycle. Then there's a fast growth. It becomes mature, and then the product starts decreasing. The same curve can be applied to an individual customer. It can be applied to a product line, as we're doing here, or to an industry. But recognize they each have the same problem. They're assuming all these customers in this group are the same, and it's ignoring different levels of change occurring simultaneously. Remember, we have five sources of change, trigger points, um, people's aging, life um, product changes, customer changes. So this averages it all together. It's not treating customers differently. In a way, it's violating the first principle of all customers different. So we go to this other way. This other way that's better, that's an improvement, is what we're recommending now is this dynamic segmentation. And it breaks customers, as I described earlier, into acquisition, expansion, and retention stages. And we give them each a name. Acquisition is customers begin with the first contact, typically before the first purchase. And you do that right up until the customer's kind of been on, we call it onboarding, when they've really been um, introduced to your product and, and it's going on smoothly. Then we go into the expansion stage. Very often the expansion is where we want to focus on cross-selling, upselling. Then retention is where we're starting to really worry about the customer leaving, and maybe we want to build some loyalty programs and such. Here's an example, uh, and I think it'll make it much more clear on how this works. Now recognize, I'm only doing this for my own customer portfolio. We call it segmentation. So these are the new customers coming in. 
So we bring in a prospective customer and here we segment the customers in each stage. So let's say we decide for this business, the acquisition stage will be any customer that's been with us for six months. So I take all my customers that have been with six months and I segment them based on their needs for my firm, which are gonna be much narrower than when I did this for the overall market, and um, what they want and how they wanna be serviced. And in this case, I found two segments. I found these learners and I found the one-timers. One-timers might be by generic, they're just, just visiting through town and they're only gonna buy the product once. In that case, they have a very low customer lifetime value, right? Because they come in, but they all, they're not even in your, in your neighborhood. So then they go all the way down and they're gonna be a lost customer. How much marketing effort do I wanna spend with those one-timers? I probably don't wanna spend much effort. However, these learners, they are people just learning about your product and becoming onboarded. They have two paths. They can go to satisfied customer or an upgraded customer. So what is the first step in dynamic segmentation? You segment customers in each stage and you name them. And we call those names personas. Personas are very similar to how we name segments, but the difference is these are our existing customers. Segments, we save that term for the whole market. Once they're in our customer portfolio, we do some more segmentation, more fine grain analysis, and we call them personas. In this case, we have a persona of one timer and a persona of learners. Where do I wanna spend my acquisition dollars? Do, do you think I wanna spend a lot of time out here acquiring one timers? No, we'll take the business. It still makes money that one time. Do I wanna give them discounts? Probably not. But learners, I like those guys because they have two paths. They're gonna become other customers. So the second step is we wanna find the migration path, the triggers and the CV, CLV of each persona, CLV being customer lifetime value. In this case, we found two paths for learners, path A to satisfied, path B to upgraded, or they can go all the way to board customers. So learners can go three places. We wanna understand what makes them go to each place each place. Satisfy might be giving you after they left, let's say you're doing a hotel, maybe the manager welcomed them, maybe gave them a free drink to go to the bar, uh, maybe gave a, a bottle of wine in their room, or maybe they did a, an email follow-up after they left. And that maybe took them into the satisfied customer path. What made him go to upgraded? I might upgrade them for their um, room. If I gave them a nicer room, that might make some more while, and I might do that because I think that customer is a customer that's spending a lot of time with competition, does a lot of travel. And we wanna, what makes people bored? It's if they don't see anything exciting about your hotel. Maybe you have, you have no bar in your hotel, you don't, up, you don't do anything for them, they're just saying, well, that hotel is just plain vanilla. We wanna understand the migration paths and the triggers. What causes them? Maybe, if the customer service people are not very friendly and they don't remember their name, even though this person comes very often, they might become bored. So you maybe want to use a relational strategy. Why do I want to know the CLV of each of these baskets? If I know the CLV, that's how much on average I'm going to earn per customer over the lifetime of that customer for each of these segments. If I know that number between these two, does that tell me how to better acquire, how to spend my acquisition dollars? Let's assume you don't do that. Let's say this half of the room does not do this analysis. So they acquire 100 customers, and they take, and they have $1,000, so they spend $10 per customer acquiring them, maybe with an email or a coupon or something. So they treat all 100 customers the same because they don't know there's any difference. This side of the room, you do this analysis, and you do CLV, and you understand that you earn 10 times more from learners than you one-timers. How are you going to describe use your hundred dollars of your your money your marketing dollars you're gonna spend all your marketing dollars on learners and you're gonna acquire more learners but that's really helpful to you because those people buy more than just one time once you learn the trigger points how can you use that if you knew the the satisfied cover customer you earned twice as much as the upgraded and three times more than the board over the lifetime, remember when I say this, it's not on one transaction, it's over the whole lifetime. You say, wow, if I treat the customer really good on the first visit and I have them go on path A rather than path 
B or C, I might earn three times to five times more over the life of that customer. Does that allow you to shift some of your marketing dollars to these learners so they, they migrate on path A versus path B or C? You see, if you have this picture of your business, you know how to spend your marketing dollars across acquisition, expansion, and retention better. What's the third step? Once you have this map with the CLVs, you understand the triggers, the CLVs, then you go, you determine the AIR, remember AIR stands for Acquisition, Expansion, Retention, Positioning, Statement, and Strategies for each persona. So all you're gonna do now is you're gonna come up with a strategy, a positioning statement says, what do you wanna do? For one-timers, it might be, we're gonna treat them nice so they give us good word of mouth, but we're not gonna spend any extra money on them and any of our marketing dollars. We're just gonna be fine, but nothing extra. Learners, we say we're gonna go over the top for learners. We're gonna really try to make their first experience, we're gonna try to delight these customers. Giving them free stuff, treating them extra nice, remembering their name. So that would be our positioning. Once we have our positioning, then we have a strategy to implement that positioning. Our positioning for learners might be, we want them to love us, delight them. One-timers is we want them to be satisfied. And we do that, and we develop these strategies to maximize the CLV overall. So CLV gives us a way to better target, very similar to competitive strength and market attractiveness did for the overall market, within our customer portfolio. So that's dynamic segmentation. Okay, I talked about customer lifetime value as an analysis tool and what is important. I wanna make a little clear on why is it so important to do CLV. I would expect from what I'm seeing happening in the market, that in 10 years time, 70 to 80% of, of the firms out there in the US, big firms, will be using CLV as their primary metric to measure customers. It has a lot of advantages. Let's give an example. Many bank initiatives, they do this thing where they give you a $500 they'll put in your checking account if you maintain $1,000 in your checking account for three months or six months. When they do these types of initiatives, only one in three customers stay in the bank after the initiative ends. So in other words, they're just coming in, they're just acquiring customers just to get that $500 bonus. Do you think they earn a very high CLV on that customer? No, they actually lose money. It's a very, very poor system. If they understood CLV, they would understand that that's not a very good way to acquire customers and they ought to look at the customers they're gonna earn a lot for. One of the worst ways to acquire customers is to put a for sale sign out. You put a sale sign out, the only customers you get are people that are very price sensitive. Now I realize sometimes you need to do it to move inventory or as a competitive response, but it's not a good way to acquire new customers. Same thing on retaining. If I go to retaining, and let's say there's 100 customers, and I hire you to be the, re the retention manager, and your metric I tell you to do is I want you to retain 96% of your customers every year. You're gonna go out and treat all the customers equal and just try to retain them. Even if one customer you're losing money on, you'll still try to retrain them because the metric I'm using to measure you is 96% retention. You don't wanna do that. You wanna retain customers based on their CLV value and say, wow, these 20 customers have super high CLV. I'm gonna work very hard to retain these. These guys down here have negative CLV, I'm losing money. If they end up leaving, I'm not really gonna be bothered by it. So CLV is allowing you to make good decision. Okay, so it evaluates the firm's profits and sum as a cash flow, as I mentioned, and it allows to do true contribution. Here's one of the benefits of it, though. There's a few. One is, and I wanna make sure everybody understands this, it allows you to capture market principle one and two. It allows you to manage customer heterogeneity. If every one of my customers in my customer portfolio has a CLV attached to it, Royal Bank of Canada does that. They have a number attached to every customer on how valuable they are expected over their period of life. Not in the past, in the future. So it captures individual customer heterogeneity which allows us to deal with the fact that all customers differ. Second, it allows us to take two dynamic effects. Because I'm going through the expected migration pattern, and how long that customer is going to stay, I account for the lifetime of the customer, their dynamic path. I pull all that together into one number, customer lifetime value. So it's taking into account both customer dynamics 
and customer heterogeneity. It allows, as I described, it allows trade-off between acquisition and expansion. If I only pay people for expansion, they're going to send over a lot of customers. If I give them $100 for every new customer they find, let's say a salesperson, they're going to find me a lot of customers that have very low CLV. It'll be easier. And then how is the retaining, the, the, the group that has to retain those customers, they're saying, wow, you're sending me these lousy customers. You're much better to retain, not based on number of new customers, but how much new CLV you brought in. You want to acquire that way and you want to retain by how many CLV dollars you retain, not just what the percent retention is. Okay, I want to go beyond the 80-20 rule. This is kind of an interesting industry-wide analysis done by um, professors here and published in the Harvard Press. They found that it wasn't the 80-20 rule, it was the 150-30 rule. That firms earn 150% of their profit from 30% of their customers. Now you might say, how is that even possible? Well, the reason it's possible is you have a lot of customers you're losing money on. So you earn 150% of your profits against only a small portion of your customers. CLV lets you take this into account. It allows you to understand at the individual level. If I told you your average customer earned $10,000, you might say, great, I earn $10,000 on every customer. That is not true. Some customers, you might be earning hundreds of thousands of dollars. Other customers, you might be losing 100,000. That average is very misleading. You want to understand the CLV per customer so it understands how much they're contributing. And this is another way to look at it across time. This is a, another study looking at four different industries, credit card, industrial, industrial distribution, auto servicing, and they looked at how much you earn, kind of a, a CLV measure, over the first five years. One thing you'll notice is normally profits go up over time with customers as they buy more. And this one's kind of interesting. So we see normally they go up over time. And this one's kind of interesting in that they lose money in credit cards. In order to bring in a new credit card customer, they lose money in that first year. Why? They spend so much money to acquire a new credit card company. Just look at how many credit card applications, people, banks sending you applications in your mail asking you to join their credit card. That costs money, it isn't very successful. But they do that because they know it's going to go up in the future. So CLV accounts for this because if we know our average customer earns this over time, we can discount that back and say, okay, it's worth, in the credit card case, it's worth losing $21 in the first period because I'm going to earn 42, 44, 49, 55, and it's going to go on and on and on in the future. So CLV accounts for differences across customers, and it accounts for differences across time. Market principle one and two, very powerful. Here's a formula that's been simplified to calculate CLV. It makes a number of assumptions. Now, typically you do this in your computer and you can just do the real formula. I just want to go through here because I want to show you all the ways marketing impacts it. It gives you an intuitive feel. We made two assumptions. Once that the customer was going to be there forever or over time. We do take into account retention rate, but we look at this over time goes to infinity. The other thing we look at is contribution margin is going to stay the same for the customer over time. What did we find? CLV for I customer, so this is an individual customer. If I want to understand what a customer's CLV with these assumptions are, I take the margin for that customer in dollars and I subtract from that the cost to keep that customer every year. So if you think about this, this is how much I earn subtracted by how much it takes to maintain that customer being a customer. I divide that by one minus the retention rate, because some customers are going to leave more than others, and the discount rate. The discount rate is what allows us to pull this into the future. So if a customer's margin goes up, obviously that adds, if you earn more on a customer, it's driving customer lifetime value. If the cost to acquire goes down, since I'm subtracting, that also makes CLV go up. Since these two numbers are being subtracted from one, the, any way I make this, as these numbers get bigger, retention rate goes up. One minus a bigger number makes the bottom smaller, the denominator smaller, and makes higher CLV. And I subtract from all of this the acquisition cost. 
So if, you, if it's cost more to acquire a customer, that reduces CLV. So this kind of shows you the things that matter. How much you earn, how much it takes to keep the customer, how likely are you to retain them, and how hard is it to acquire them. And this is just the interest rate that you use to discount it forward. So it kind of gives you a flavor on all the factors that go into customer lifetime value. Royal Bank of Canada, which is actually a very good marketer, actually came up with a way to, they use CLV by searching their database and finding some high CLV customers and going after them. In this case, they found that medical students, they search through the database and say, wow, these medical students over their lifetime, we earn a lot of money off of those guys. So because we know we're gonna earn a lot of money in the future, let's work a lot harder in acquiring these medical students. So what they did is they went out early in the medical student's career, they developed a program to satisfy their needs early in the progression of their careers. Products such as credit cards, help with student loans, loans to set up new practice. So they went to this doctor that's getting ready to this medical student and say, oh, you're gonna graduate in two years. We have a special program just for med students. We'll give you a great low interest credit card. When you wanna start up your practice, we'll give you a low interest loan. We'll, a lot of times it's hard to get loans when, you're, when you have no history of business. You say, well, how much money has your business made? Well, you haven't done it yet. They understood the medical student and they designed special programs for them. So they understood their dynamics, they understood their CLV, and they went way upstream and developed a program to go after these students. In the first year of this program, RBC's, Royal Bank of Canada's market share, increased from 2% to 18%. So they owned 18% of all the med students graduating in their market in Canada. Their average sales were four times higher than the average customer, and these customers were very loyal. What's the advantage of loyalty? Good word of mouth. You don't have to spend a lot to retain them. They're gonna give you more business. Very, very successful program. They would have never understood that if they didn't understand customer dynamics. Because if you only looked at the med student right then and there, they weren't worth that much in their you know, last year of residency or whatever. They weren't earning that much money. It's only looking at it over the lifetime of that customer could you figure out that they were worth a lot of money. Lost customer analysis is a good way to get some data on customer dynamics. The disadvantage is you're looking into the rear view mirror. The customer's already lost. You'd rather look earlier before you lose them. But after you lose them, there's a lot of information in that because these customers dealt with you for numerous years potentially and they decided to leave. They took effort to leave. So let's go through how customer um, lifetime or lost customer analysis work. A firm contacts customers that have migrated away from the firm and then they work backward to fix the problem. The problem is one thing, one issue is it takes significant number of lost customers to really understand what the problem is and, and you hate to wait that. A company called AOL, American Online, was used to sell accounts in the early days of the internet. You could have email and you could have a couple things there. They did really well for a period and then they started losing customers. At one point they were losing 50,000 customers a month. Obviously you can't go on too long losing customers of 50,000 a month. Um, but there's a lot of inf information in it. So we have a three-step process for analyzing lost customers. What you do is you set up a regular way to reach out to your customers and contact them. You don't let the salesperson or the normal customer service person call them because they might have been part of the problem. You have another group call up the customer or visit in some cases if it's um, few enough of large customers and you say you've stopped buying from us and I'd like to understand why you did. What was the problem? So you set up those things, you contact them, you find out why they went and where they went. If the lost customer is not in the firm's target segment, let's say you were paying your acquisition group bonuses to acquire customers and they wired, acquired a bunch of customers that didn't fit with your firm's business. Well of course you're going to lose them. It's kind of like that bank's $500 in your checking account if you start a new account after a year or after six months. They, of course you're going to lose them because a lot of those people are acquiring probably don't even want to deal with that bank. If the customer is not in the firm's segment, you want to change your acquisition criteria so you don't go after those, don't spend money on bad fitting customers. And the other thing you want to do is you want to evaluate expansion. Expansion to a new suit. If these are good customers, maybe you want to start a new segment, another product. That's kind of what um, Acura did a little bit in the example I gave earlier. If the lost customer is in the target market, so in other words, you acquired a good customer and still lost them, 
Well, obviously you need to fix the problem if it's poor service, the product fails, you're too high priced. But the other thing you could do is you could implement retention strategies. Kind of like airline loyalty programs, something to lock those customers in more. You know, locking them with contracts always isn't good because customers don't necessarily like that, as kind of cell phone companies and cable TV companies know. But you can build other loyalty programs. We do have an analysis tool that helps us to understand lost customers. It's used very common. Every cell phone company runs these models. It's called a choice model. It can inform lost customer analysis. It actually works across all the air stages because it predicts the likelihood of a customer leaving and it also shows what factors drove them to leave. So let me go through that a little bit more. What is a choice model? And if you look in the book, it goes in a lot more detail. And we have a, a, a data case on it too. But what are choice models? It's an analysis approach that attempts to determine the impact of different factors, we call those input variables or independent variables, on the consumer's individual choice. There's a couple things here that I need to explain. First, this is a very interesting model because it operates at the individual customer level. If I had up, let's say I had 250 customers in this conference room, and I go and you're my customers in over a year, 20 of you leave, you're lost customers, 20 or 30 of you leave. I'd run this choice model on you, and the, the choice would be everybody who left, I would give um, a one, and everybody who stayed, I'd give a zero, let's say. So there's a choice, it's a dichotomous choice, one or zero. And I'd looked at everything I did, who, what kind of training we gave you, maybe the cost of this, um, if there's lunches or there meals, I'd look at the type of meals we gave you, I'd look at all those input variables. What that's going to give me, once I run this model based on those characteristics, it would tell me for every customer in the database, what is your probability of leaving in the next cycle. I could also take this model and apply it to a different group of customers, and it'll give me a percent probability of a customer leaving. If this group of customers down here have 99% chance of staying, am I going to spend a lot of extra money giving them discounts in order to stay? No, because they're hooked into staying. If these people have zero probability of staying, am I going to spend a lot of marketing dollars on them for retention? No, because they're lost cause. I'm really going to focus on these people in the middle at like 30 to 70% chance of staying because I can really impact them. In the cell phone world, what they would often do if you're at a 50-50 ball, that you're, you're almost likely to leave, you're not sure, maybe six months before your contract expires, they would send you an email and say, if you come in now and you extend your contract, I'll give you a new handset six months early. People say, wow, that's a good deal. I don't have to wait to the contract. And they renew them, so they overlap those contracts. That would be one example. So one thing it gives you, it gives you data at the individual person level, which many models or techniques like regression analysis does not do. And that's why we call it an individual level response model. You don't have to survey anybody. You use past behavioral data, data in your CRM system and database. It also gives you the elasticity. This is important. For every variable in the model, it tells you for a 1% change of the input variable, how much impact would that have on retention or the output variable. So it gives you a lot of data. So pretty much most firms that I deal with almost always run choice models on customers that leave. It tells them why they're leaving, and from that, what strategies are most effective to keeping customers, as well as they can run it on their existing customer base and find out which customers are likely to leave in the future and so they could go focus on them. So probably, it's the best technique for finding air strategies. So after determining air positioning, for each, for each stage, and ranking personas on CLV, you develop an AIR marketing strategy, AER, Acquisition, Expansion, Retention. What tells you what strategies to do? The ones with the highest elasticity. You use the database of past marketing actions and demographics linked to actual customer choices as inputs to the choice. The choice model provides these elasticities I spoke of. It'll also provide probabilities of the customer's if you ran it for upselling, retention, or even for acquisition, you can run it too. The last feature that's very interesting 
Rather than run it on our, all our customers, we could do this thing we call a latent class choice, which also clusters customers at the same time, or segments clusters, segments customers at the same time we're running the choice. Because guess what? There might be variations across the group. There might be one group of customers here that are leaving because the customer service is poor, and another group here that are leaving because the price is too high. If I did a choice model on all of you combined, it would wash out a little of the price, wash out a little of the customer service. If I run this, it'll break it into two groups and find, wow, here's a tight group that customer service is the issue, here's a group and the elasticity associated with them on pricing. So then I know not to cut the price of the customer service people, it just improves service on the price. I don't have to worry about customer service, I just focus on, on price. So that's kind of the approaches for dealing with it. We saw, we went through the evolution, we looked at life cycle being kind of averaging it all together as kind of the old fashioned approach. Now we're seeing dynamic segmentation is a much better way to deal with that. One metric we want to use, or one analysis we want to use across all of this is we want to treat customers and act and, and make our decisions based on customer lifetime value. Because we know how much we're earning today, like those med students might be very low, it doesn't account for how much I'm going to earn for them over their life. So I want to make marketing decisions based on their customer lifetime value. And we see that a tool for doing this, for understanding what drives customers' choice, is the choice model. Now I'm going to go through the framework for applying these. Input, output, and process. Pretty straightforward. First, inputs. We have three inputs. A lot of this comes from your CRM data, which is customer relationship management data. Kind of like a salesforce.com or Oracle has one or Microsoft Dynamics. Your customer data. So when we did this for market principle one, we looked at the whole market. Now we're focused more narrowly just on our own customer portfolio. We look at our, under cust our individual customers, sales, margins, and cost, and their needs and behaviors. Very similar as we did for the overall market, but this is just for our existing customers. We look at what prog programs in the past works for acquisition, expansion, and retention. We're going to do a lot of choice models on that to understand which of these programs have the highest elasticity and the highest ROIs. We're also going to look at the customers leaving because there's good information there. We're going to feed that into this box. This box allows us to manage customer dynamics. The life cycle approach is a technique, but we understand its weaknesses. We're probably going to mostly focus on dynamic segmentation or air segmentation. We're going to do the lost customer analysis. And down here, we're going to use CLV. I didn't speak of hidden Markov models. That's a way that diagram I drew where I did the dynamic segmentation. Hidden Markov is a method to do all of that simultaneously rather than break into three groups. But it's a little beyond um, the presentation today, but it is discussed in the book. Choice models, I went through, and then factor, cluster, and discriminant analysis are techniques from market principle one, and we're still going to use them in market principle two. What do we get as an output? We get a segmentation again, but this is a segmentation of our existing customers, not of the whole market. We get our error positioning statements, which tells us for each persona, what do we want that customer to feel about us? It's the who, what, where kind of an answer for each segment, each persona. And then what strategy works for each persona or each positioning statement? That tells us how we want to manage our customers through the acquisition, expansion, and retention stages. This grid, we call this the air strategy grid. This is where we list each persona. If you think back on the example, we look at the three stages, acquisition, expansion, retention, and we identify the most effective strategy. Remember we talked about earlier that maybe for the learners in the acquisition stage, you wanted to delight them. And maybe that was giving them uh, free drinks at the bar, one round of free drinks at the bar for new customers that you feel are in that learner persona. And you would put that. So the acquisition expansion might be six months, a year down the road, we might find the learners. The best way to expand them to get to buy another product is to um, make them an automatic member of the loyalty program where every 10 stays they get another stay for free 
one stent, um, an extra one for free. And then you do the same for Persona 2 and Persona 3. All this does is capture the information we discussed earlier from the dynamic segmentation. You list your personas, you list at the different stages, what works best in each one. What's nice about this is these three stages are really accounting for customer dynamics and these three personas are accounting for customer heterogeneity. So it's taking into account both market principle one and market principle two. Ideally, we also like to know the CLV of each of those stages. Okay, so the process. So we did the input, the outputs, now we're gonna do the process. The process to convert CRM and market program and lost input into dynamic segmentation and error positioning and strategies, managers should follow the sequence of steps. First, you do the dynamic segmentation. Break customers into the three groups, acquisition, expansion, retention, and do cluster analysis on each one and then identify each of those groups, each of those personas, and understand their trigger points. Why do they move from one persona to the next persona? Why do they go from learner to satisfied customer? Why do they go from learner to board customer? You wanna know why they go to board because they're almost lost. You might wanna prevent that, whatever that is occurring. Calculate the customer lifetime value, end of migrations. Sometimes if you force a migration from one stage from a learner to satisfied customer, it might double their CLV if you can get them to make that migration. So if that's the case and you wanna spend a lot of effort to do it. Banks have learned that. Banks have learned if you can buy three products from them, you're much more likely to be a long, long-term customer. So if they get you with a credit card, they try to add a checking account and a savings account or maybe a mortgage. So they understand those expansion strategies really pay off. Once you do the segmentation, you know the migration, you know the customer lifetime value, then you can design your positioning statements. That tells you what you wanna do to each persona. Then you design your strategies on how you wanna move people through the dynamic segmentation. We saw Buick in the example did not do that. They just let people go through naturally. They should have learned they weren't bringing in people. They weren't keeping or bringing in and acquiring younger consumers and they needed to change that. Okay, that ends the, um, this session. What we kind of went through is market principle two, the idea that all customers change. And because we know customers change, there's five different sources of, um, Customer change and why? We have to manage customer dynamics. We looked at some tools for doing that, probably the biggest tool being dynamic segmentation and applying the dynamic segmentation and making our decisions using CLV analysis. And also we saw the power of using choice models in this. That's it, thank you. <laughs>